Good morning. Scott Luton here with you on this edition of This Week in Business History. Welcome to today's show. On this program, which is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming, we take a look back at the upcoming week, and then we share some of the most relevant events and milestones from years past. Of course, mostly business-focused, with a little dab of global supply chain, and occasionally, we might just throw in a good story outside of our primary realm. So I invite you to join me on this look back in history to identify some of the most significant leaders, companies, innovations, and perhaps lessons learned in our collective business journey. Now, let's dive in to this week in business history. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Scott Luton. And today on this edition of This Week in Business History, we're focused on the week of January 18th. Thanks so much for listening to the show. Hey, before we get started today, let's pause for a moment to reflect on the central figure of our story today, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I must be transparent and honest with you. It's been difficult to write a story or a podcast and feel like you're giving this extraordinary leader worthy enough recognition or credit. It has been a humbling experience for sure. He was born January 15, 1929, and taken from us all way too early on April 4, 1968, not even 40 years old. Martin Luther King Jr. moved mountains. He faced enormous tidal waves of hate and never blinked. His massive efforts helped address and change so many injustices and made the U.S. a much better country. But we still have so much more work to do. As he sat in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote these forever relevant words, quote, We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right, end quote. He found the inner fortitude to write one of the most important literary pieces of the 20th century letter from Birmingham jail, despite experiencing horrible conditions. As former federal judge Constance Baker Motley, who visited Dr. King in that jail, would later recall, quote, The three of us went in. I instantly ran back out, overcome by the stench. I finally decided that I had to go inside and talk to King. I saw him and Abernathy in their four-by-six-foot cell. It was July or August, The temperature must have been 100 degrees. We could hear other prisoners in a back room yelling and moaning. Since the prison food was not edible, some women had brought food for King and Abernathy, which their jailers had placed uncovered on a table outside their cell, and by then it was covered with hundreds of flies. King and Abernathy usually fasted while in jail. We spent at least an hour there without seeing anyone. Whether anyone could see us, I could not tell. I feared we would be ambushed. My visit to the jail was the most horrendous experience of my life. It was then I realized that we did indeed have a new civil rights leader, a man willing to die for our freedom, end quote. Today is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day here in the United States, but we enjoy, whether we know it or not, his legacy each and every day, though we've got A lot more work to do for sure. I find Dr. King's work, perspective, and point of view to be exceedingly important during this time of social injustice, strife, divisiveness, and challenging circumstances. On today's show, we've assembled a list of seven cities that were important in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s journey in one way or another. As we put this show together today, I certainly learned several new things about Dr. King. And I hope that today's episode might share something or two new with you about this incredible, bold, visionary agent for change that is such an enormous titan in our collective journey. Stay tuned as we discuss Martin Luther King Jr. today. And thanks again for joining us here today on This Week in Business History, powered by our team here at Supply Chain Now. Okay, our first city on our list of seven cities that shaped Martin Luther King Jr.'s journey might just surprise you. Berlin, Germany, 
Dr. King's father, the Reverend Michael King Sr., became the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta in 1931. In 1934, the church sent him to Europe to attend a Baptist World Alliance conference. The trip abroad would take Reverend King through Rome, Egypt, Jerusalem, and many other intriguing cities. When he arrived in Berlin, Germany for the conference, Reverend King would tour much of Germany, the same country that is the birthplace of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, of course, led the Protestant Reformation and allegedly nailed his 95 theses to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg on October 31, 1517. Upon his return to Atlanta, Reverend Michael King Sr. was so inspired by his travels that he changed his name to Martin Luther King Sr., and he changed his oldest son's name as well. Michael King Jr. had been born in 1929 and was about five years old, but from that point on, he would be known, and eventually around the world, as Martin Luther King Jr. Our next city on the list is Atlanta, Georgia. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January 15, 1929, in his family's home at 501 Auburn Avenue Northeast in Atlanta, in a neighborhood that's referred to as Sweet Auburn. The home where Dr. King lived for the first 12 years of his life became part of the National Park Service in November 2018. It was here in Atlanta where he would have some of his earliest experiences of hate, racism, and segregation. But it was also Atlanta where Dr. King would learn leadership lessons from his father, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., who was active in the city demanding social change. Dr. King would be named a minister at Ebenezer Baptist Church at the age of 18. It was also in Atlanta where Dr. King would grow in his education as he would graduate from Morehouse College at the young age of 19 years old. Dr. King would help form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in the 1950s, which would set up a small office in Atlanta. The SCLC has been and continues to be a powerful organization that works to eradicate racism and provide opportunity for all. The SCLC's first president was Martin Luther King Jr. In November 1959, Dr. King would become co-pastor of the iconic Ebenezer Baptist Church located in the heart of Atlanta and now is adjacent to the King Center and Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park. It is at this park where Dr. King and Coretta Scott King's burial place and memorial can be found. And despite the injustices that existed in Atlanta and Georgia during Dr. King's time, I'd still like to think that Atlanta's community is what helped provide key early momentum to Dr. King's journey and mission. Number three on our list of seven cities that shaped Martin Luther King Jr.'s journey, Simsbury, Connecticut. Simsbury is located about 12 miles northwest of Hartford. It was settled in 1670 and is listed on the National Trust for Historic Preservation, part of the Dozen Distinctive Destinations list. It's also home to William Phelps Eno, known as the father of the traffic light, and Henry F. Phillips, who invented the Phillips screwdriver. Dr. King spent a couple of summers in Simsbury, where he worked on a tobacco farm as an undergraduate at Morehouse College. These experiences would further his journey towards a life in the ministry, and it would also impact his developing views on race, segregation, and injustice. In June 1944, Dr. King would write his father from Simsbury and say, quote, On our way here, we saw some things I had never anticipated to see. After we passed Washington, there was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go to any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to, end quote. Dr. King would share with his mother that, quote, I never thought that a person of my race could eat anywhere, but we ate in one of the finest restaurants in Hartford, end quote. That is absolutely heartbreaking to read. Clearly, Dr. King's time spent in Simsbury would be incorporated into his vision for all of society in the years ahead. The next city on our list, city number four, is Montgomery, Alabama. Martin Luther King Jr.'s time spent in Alabama would help transform him into a national leader and personality. It all started, though, with Dr. King's first full-time job as a pastor. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery hired Dr. King as pastor 
in 1954. This church had quite a history. It was founded in 1877, initially named Second Colored Baptist Church. Its earliest services were held in a building that had been used for slave trade. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus that was part of the Montgomery city lines. She was promptly arrested. Rosa Parks would say in her autobiography entitled My Story that, quote, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically or no more tired than I usually was at the end of a working day. I was not old, although some people have an image of me as being old then. I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in, end quote. The next day, Dr. King would lead a meeting at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. The gathering would lead to the Montgomery bus boycott, which would be directed by Dr. King. The Montgomery Improvement Association would be formed with Dr. King as its president. African Americans would refuse to ride city buses throughout Montgomery, Alabama. It would run from December 5, 1955 to December 20, 1956, and many point to this event as the first large-scale demonstration against social injustice and for civil rights in the U.S. As a result of both the boycott and litigation, Montgomery integrated its bus service on December 21, 1956, but not without violence. Shootings and bombings took place throughout the city. In fact, on January 30, 1956, Dr. King's own home in Montgomery was bombed. Fortunately, it didn't harm him or his family. As a large, angry crowd assembled at his house after the bombing, Dr. King would tell them, quote, Don't get your weapons. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Remember, that is what God said. We are not advocating violence. We want to love our enemies. I want you to love our enemies. Be good to them. Love them and let them know you love them. I did not start this boycott. I was asked by you to serve as your spokesman. I want it to be known through the length and breadth of this land that if I am stopped, this movement will not stop. For what we are doing is right. What we are doing is just. And God is with us. End quote. For Dr. King, though, the effectiveness of the boycott and his leadership through the Montgomery Improvement Association would catapult him onto the national stage. His first book, Stride Toward Freedom, focuses on the Montgomery bus boycott. Our next city, city number five, as we walk through seven cities that shaped Martin Luther King Jr.'s journey, that would be Harlem, New York. On September 20th, 1958, in Bloomstein's department store in Harlem, Dr. King was signing copies of his first book, Stride Toward Freedom. A 42-year-old woman approached him and asked, Are you Martin Luther King? He responded, Yes. Then, Isola Curry lunged over the desk and stabbed Dr. King with a sharp 7-inch letter opener. It barely missed his aorta, which surely would have led to his death. As it was, Dr. King endured emergency surgery and was in the hospital for weeks. However, it's been said that the incident deepened Dr. King's resolve for action through nonviolent means. Number six on our list is back in the South, Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham is about 90 miles north and slightly west of Montgomery. Its nickname is the Magic City, which is derived from the city's rapid explosion of growth back in the late 19th century, mainly due to the iron and steel industry setting up shop. In April 1963, Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference would join several organizations to form the Birmingham Campaign. The mission behind the campaign was to fight the city's widespread segregation and other social injustices. On Good Friday, April 12, 1963, Dr. King was arrested in Birmingham in a seminal moment in his journey to change our country. From that jail cell, in hard conditions, Dr. King would use whatever paper he'd have access to, including the margins of the Daily Birmingham News newspaper, all in order to document and share what was going through his mind. Those thoughts would later be collected and eventually published as Letter from Birmingham Jail, 
the main sentiment Dr. King was expressing through about 7,000 words was in response to a group of local clergy whom didn't support the Birmingham campaign. In the letter, Dr. King would state, quote, For years now, I've heard the word wait. This wait has almost always meant never, end quote. After White House intervention, he would finally be released from jail on April 20th. But Birmingham was becoming the epicenter of the civil rights movement and erupted into violence and chaos, much of it due to a local city leader's approach. You may have heard of Bull Connor, the legendary Brass Knuckles Birmingham official who unleashed fire hoses, police dogs, and batons on scores of protesters. In light of the violence and mounting pressure to take action, on June 11, 1963, President John F. Kennedy announced in a national television address that his administration would send a civil rights bill to Congress. The Kennedy administration would deliver on that pledge on June 19th, just about a week later. But the elevation of the civil rights discussion by the highest office in the land would not stop the violence and destruction. On September 15, 1963, amongst other bombings, the KKK would bomb the 16th Street Baptist Church with 15 sticks of dynamite, which very sadly killed four young African-American girls, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, all were 14 years old, and Carol Denise McNair was 11. It became the latest in a number of tragedies that probably had many Americans asking themselves, is this the country that I live in? As we arrive at the final stop in this episode, sharing seven cities that shaped Martin Luther King Jr.'s journey, we arrive at city number seven, Washington, D.C. Perhaps the biggest moment that Washington, D.C. had a huge part in as it relates to Dr. King's journey involved the event that took place on the 28th day of August, 1963. Some 200,000 people from across the country descended on the national capital to demand action on a variety of fronts. A comprehensive civil rights bill, protection of voting rights, the desegregation of all public schools, and much more. Towards the end of the event, and in a legendary and iconic moment that has lived in our minds ever since, and one that will hopefully stir generations to come, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed the attendees and live television audience from in front of the Lincoln Memorial. He gave the historic I Have a Dream speech. But according to author William P. Jones, there was a lot of heartburn amongst the various organizers as related to giving the prestigious final keynote slot to the really young Dr. King. But Dr. King was already famous for his oratorical talent. And Jones would tell USA Today that the decision was finalized once all parties realized how difficult it'd be to follow a Dr. King address. That was probably a very shrewd move. However, as some might not know, Dr. King's most powerful elements of that day's address were improvised. And it was largely prompted by a quick shout to Dr. King by Mahalia Jackson, an American gospel singer, who encouraged him to, quote, tell them about the dream, end quote. After the March on Washington, Dr. King and other leaders met with President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson. Many of the goals of the march would be addressed in two pieces of legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As I shared at the beginning of our podcast today, you just never can do a figure like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. justice. It's difficult indeed to share a few key passages from a journey that was filled with chapter after chapter of important contributions and defining moments of leadership. Dr. King would make important stops across the country, from St. Augustine, Florida, to New York City, from the Holy City of Charleston, South Carolina, to Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California. He was arrested some 29 times and assaulted at least four times. His home was bombed. His family was attacked. He was belittled, mistreated, heckled, harassed, and persecuted. But Dr. King never departed from his core approach of nonviolent means of driving change. And change he certainly did impact on our business community, our country, and the world. And although he was stopped by an assassin's bullet in 1968, 
Dr. King's message of equality, peace, dignity, and opportunity for all persists and perseveres. It's relentless and undeniable. Let's all embrace that timeless message and accept the responsibility that we have as leaders to ensure that our country realizes Dr. King's dream in full. And I'll leave you with this today, which comes directly from Dr. King, who said, quote, We must walk on in the days ahead with an audacious faith in the future, end quote. Seems apropos to me. Well, that just about wraps up this edition of This Week in Business History. In our judgment, especially in light of where things stand here in the earliest days of 2021, there is no other story as important nor relevant as the one of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for this week. On that note, thanks to you, our listener, for tuning into the show each week. On behalf of the entire team here at This Week in Business History and Supply Chain Now, this is Scott Luton wishing all of our listeners nothing but the best. Hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on This Week in Business History. Thanks, everybody.